people will come in. Welcome everybody um, to our first and what will be a series of our COVID-19 research um, sort of projects. So we have um, three presenters today. And let's see here. Do you wanna go ahead and forward that Vanessa for me? Thank you. All right, I'm gonna just sort of put the, the slides up and give you a sense of who's presenting today and what will be presented today. But I wanted to say that the series overall is gonna cover the translational continuum. So we, amazingly enough, not surprisingly enough, the PRC's deep expertise and infrastructure allowed us to sort of rapidly respond to this new COVID environment uh, with rigorous and, and innovative research. Um, we're really well positioned in the center to generate insight, test interventions and influence policy. Um, and I'm really excited that we have so many people sort of working um, around this, this topic, which is just so incredibly important um, right now, uh, nationally and internationally, of course. Um, I wanted to let you know, and I'll put this, it's actually gonna be on the last slide, but I'll just, I'll say it now and then I'll close with it um, after our speakers today. We have two other dates in the series already identified um, for additional uh, research projects that will be presented. It will be February 2nd. Um, right now we have Stephanie Lanza and Court, uh, Courtney West, uh, Wetzel and Kristen Connell slated for that day. There may be some, some shifting of this depending um, on sort of where research projects stand, but that's the current lineup for the second. And on February 23rd, um, it will be myself presenting on Data for Action and Sarah Cheslinski. So two more um, in our series to come. Uh, the format for today, again, you can see we do have the three presenters. Um, we're going to have 15 minutes for each presenter and then we'll hold questions and discussion for the final 15 minutes of the seminar. We're going to keep the room open though past one o'clock because we, we I, I really do anticipate that there's going to be some nice discussion around this and we certainly don't want to cut it off short. So for those of you who are able to stay and interested in staying, the room will be held open after one o'clock. So with that, we're going to get started. Um, Greg Fosco will be our first presenter um, presenting on his work in family vulnerability. So Greg, I'm Got it right here. <laughs> Thanks, Meg. <laughs> no pressure. We've got 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. So are folks seeing my title slide? No. Oh, all right. I'm going to stop so that we can, you don't get dinged for that. <laughs> oh, I see what I did. OK. How about now? Yes. All right. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to be here, uh, and I think this is such a, a fascinating and exciting topic. So I'll be presenting on um, some really preliminary findings uh, from the project that Mark Feinberg and I uh, kind of adapted or kind of pivoted from our PROSPER project. So this talk will be focusing on developmental models and risk models for family vulnerability and disruption during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the outcome of interest here is gonna be children's adjustment. So um, although my name's the only one listed on the docket today, um, this is a co-authored piece with Kylie Sloan, Shi Chen Fang, and Mark Feinberg, of course. Okay. So just before I dive in, I wanna acknowledge this is a project that was funded originally by NICHD and we used funds from it. Um, you know, got permission to continue during COVID with this study that I'll be presenting on today. But we also received really important support from the HUC uh, Institutes and uh, SSRI from that kind of seed grant mechanism they posted. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the research team, Katrina and Shi Chen, Michelle, Devin, and Carly have been critical in, in getting this project um, to, out in the field and, and, and make it possible. And this was done with support from the Prosper Executive Committee. Um, and I just want to Acknowledge also that Cleve Redmond was an important part of the original P2G study, and, and I'm sad that we lost him in the last year. Uh, and so I just wanted to acknowledge his kind of presence in this project and these data. Um, when the, the focus of this study is really the early days of this COVID pandemic. So um, when this first set in, we turned to guidance that was established by the CDC around non-pharmaceutical interventions to prevent pandemic influenza. And this really had three major domains. Um, there was a focus on personal measures, that's your hand washing, your mask wearing, uh, staying home when you're sick, 
uh, and environmental measures, which is really around cleaning surfaces um, in rooms or, or shared spaces. And then the big one that I think we feel the most profound impacts from are the community measures. These community measures are all of those changes to our so, uh, kind of surrounding environment, the school closures and dismissals, um, having to postpone or cancel mass gatherings, um, childcare closures, public closures, uh, workplace social distancing. Many people experience a transition to remote work or even job loss um, and restricted travel. So in the context of all of these community measures, we really were experiencing a new lifestyle and it was pretty drastic. Uh, schools cleared out, childcare centers were empty and playgrounds were shut down and not in the most kind of um, <laughs> friendly way, but like caution tape was not an uncommon approach to doing this. And this has led families to take the burden of responsibility um, now, all of those things that were attended to by community settings had to be addressed in the family. And this meant a lot of time together in one home, um, creative attempts to create one's own life in this space while constantly with others, uh, balancing childcare responsibilities with working from home for many people, while others were dealing with challenges around separation from loved ones because of concerns about vulnerability to this pandemic illness leading to some creative efforts to stay connected and to you know, experience connection with other humans and our family members, even while navigating these stressful times. So it's not surprising that people quickly became concerned about well, what do we need to do to keep our children from having lifelong problems and concerns about mental health took, started beginning to take, started to take center stage. When we were asked questions about what kind of guidance we could offer, we really turned quickly to our general findings from family science. But this is family science under normal circumstances or typical life. And so in this space, we look at two major domains of the family where we think about family level functioning, like cohesion or emotional bonding among family members, levels of conflict in the family, and that structure that comes from routines in the household. And we also think about parenting practices as a very critical part of children's mental health, where we wanna see warm and supportive parenting and low levels of harsh or lax parenting. But the real question that we've been struggling with is what we think we know under typical circumstances may or may not be salient features of promoting or of resilience during COVID-19 or promoting mental health during these unusual circumstances. And so, we have started looking at the evidence that's available to try to think through what might be important. Looking at research related to kind of changes in financial circumstances, data from the 2008 recession and data generally from research on economic pressure uh, indicate that financial strain is an important impact on parents' mental health, their quality of parenting, such as decreases in warmth and increases in harshness, uh, even during acute changes. Uh, we look at research about social support and what happens when we are cut off from that. And there's data that suggests that the family is a system that is nurtured by these external inputs, these that we think of as social support that kind of feed the mental health and well being of the individuals that take it then into the home and benefit from that in their family relations. And we're starting to see some studies coming out now related specific to COVID that suggests this social isolation is a salient theme that individuals are reporting and that they're experiencing a lot of emotional distress and anxiety related to that social isolation. And finally, a new term is emerging around confinement related stress. And this is the idea of being kind of stuck in the home, spending a lot more time than ever before together while also having to balance these work demands, our desire to have our own social lives and connections with people outside of the home and having limited options for going to those places, seeing those people are engaging in recreation that are often critical um, kind of resources for coping. And so we're beginning to theorize about the impact of confinement related stress on family functioning. So two broad theoretical models of the family are particularly relevant to 
application in this COVID context. And one is this risky families model that really emphasizes the benefit of warm and nurturant family relations and the risk associated with harsh or conflictual family relations for child outcomes. But also the idea that variability or unpredictability of these experiences in the home is very dysregulating and stressful for children and can undermine their health and well being. Another perspective is the family resilience model that really emphasizes these kind of core components of the family around cohesive relationships, problem solving skills, adaptability, and organization, as well as effective parenting, like parental warmth and constructive parenting, which is really referring to low levels of harshness. In this perspective, as it's been applied in theory to the COVID context, parent emotional distress, parent, which is referring to depression or anxiety, is thought to be a key driver of family vulnerability. So distilling this down to the current study, we're really thinking about two key pathways that may be related to children's mental health outcomes. The first is a family vulnerability pathway that really suggests that the ways in which families were functioning prior to onset of COVID may become amplified under these times of stress and strain and thereby impacting children's uh, mental health outcomes. This would be found if kind of pre-existing conditions were predictive of children's mental health during COVID. The other pathway is this disruption pathway, which is the degree to which family relations, routines, or parenting declines may change from pre to post COVID and those disruptions to relationship quality and deteriorated parenting may be a risk mechanism for children's mental health outcomes. We also are gonna draw on kind of theorizing around parents' emotional distress and financial strain as key factors, and we'll be controlling for child mental health prior to COVID onset. So the study I'm drawing data from today is from our PROSPER second generation, which was an intergenerational trial of the original PROSPER uh, study that began in 2001 and has continuously followed a cohort or two cohorts of these youth into their young adult years. They're now in their mid to late twenties and they're starting to have children of their own. And so this study was sampling those that had kids uh, ideally between ages two and seven, but we started opening up those gates a little bit. Um, at the time COVID hit, we had about 244 families that had already participated in their first wave of data collection. And we invited them to participate in web-based surveys that should take about 15 minutes every two weeks after COVID is set. And that started in early May while we were still under a lot of restrictions. Um, they had not started you know, changing our light from red light to yellow and green. Um, this COVID sample was 204 of those 244 families. Children were about 4.2 years old, ranging though from two to 10. These are predominantly white, semi-rural or rural families. 45% of children were girls in this study and 79% of these families were two household, uh, two caregiver households. Uh, we tested for selection effects from the original P2G sample and we could not find any differences uh, in any of the family factors or baseline characteristics uh, for our sample compared to the original sample that we had begun collecting. So we collected data, uh, we drew on the data we had already collected related to children's internalizing and externalizing problems, our key domains of child mental health. Uh, and we also had the uh, Center for Epidemiological Studies, um, Depression Scale, and the Penn State Worry Questionnaire um, for parent emotional distress. These were nicely correlated, so we combined them into this kind of broader emotional distress measure. We measured financial strain as the financial strain index. Drawing on that pre-COVID to post-COVID assessment, we had measures of cohesion, conflict, and routines at the family level. And we had measures of harsh and lax parenting as well as parental warmth. And then at a third time point, also post-COVID, uh, we reassessed children's internalizing and externalizing using brief measures that we adapted to be similar to uh, the child behavior checklist, but considerably shorter uh, due to time constraints. So we operationalize our research questions within a structural equation model um, that I'm gonna kind of walk through really quickly. So our family vulnerability pathway would be identified as a main effect for pre-existing family level and parenting um, before COVID as being directly associated with children's internalizing and externalizing problems during the COVID pandemic. 
And the disruption pathway is operationalized as latent change in family functioning from pre-COVID to COVID. And it may be the degree of change in family or parenting processes that is associated with children's internalizing and externalizing problems. Um, all of these models controlled for the pre-COVID levels of internalizing and externalizing. And we included parents' emotional distress and financial strain prior to COVID onset as also, also as predictors of internalizing and externalizing problems. So what we did on the back end, and I'm not gonna have all these crazy figures is that we ran six models. And I'm gonna just summarize my findings here, first at the family level across these three um, domains. And then again, I'll talk through the parenting results for these three aspects of parenting. So at the family level, um, our findings did not support evidence for pre-existing family functioning as a predictor of children's adjustment post-COVID. However, the disruption pathway was a bit more fruitful. And we found that decreases in family cohesion were positively associated with increases in internalizing problems, just as inter uh, increases in conflict in the home was related to increases in children's internalizing and externalizing problems. Interestingly, family routines or changes in family routines were not associated with children's mental health outcomes. Parents' emotional distress was a robust predictor of children's internalizing problems in each of these models. That direct effect holds up and was related to externalizing problems in one of the three. And interestingly, the model related to uh, family level conflict. Pre-COVID financial strain was not associated with children's mental health outcomes or disruption to the family in any of these three models. Okay, so pivoting over to our parenting models, we're gonna ask the same questions. In this, in this set of models, uh, family vulnerability was supported in one of three where harsh parenting was directly associated with children's internalizing problems. However, family disruption had more effects in that increases in harsh parenting, increases in lax parenting, each were associated with increases in children's internalizing and externalizing problems. But changes in parental warmth was not associated with children's adjustment. Parents' emotional distress had a very similar profile in the parenting models, where we found that Emotional distress was associated with more internalizing problems across all three, and again, one of the three for externalizing, and that was the parenting model that included lax parenting. Again, financial strain really not showing a whole lot of effects. However, it was associated with disruptions in parenting related to increased lax parenting. So families of greater financial strain saw an increase in laxness. Great, thank you. I'm gonna give you just a one minute warning. Okay. Thanks. I'm pretty close. So that's good. Thank you for the warning. Okay. So these findings really suggest that family disruption is a key target. And I think this is a take home for intervention science that can look to help families return back to where they were before COVID with emphasis on family cohesion and family conflict or this relationship quality, as well as harsh and lax parenting. Parents' emotional distress seems to be really important as well, but we don't really understand what the mechanism is linking parents' distress prior to COVID to children's mental health outcomes post-COVID. So opportunities for intervention are really promoting cohesion with family activities and find, carving out time to spend positive, um, kind of participating games, have fun time, not to lose sight of the importance of that, for parents to learn effective problem-solving skills in this new context of confinement, and really revisiting the use of effective limit setting skills and avoid um, emotionally reactive parenting. And also to make sure parents are engaging in the appropriate discipline practices. And our takeaway, the surprises were really that family routines and parental warmth were not the drivers we thought they would be, despite a lot of media attention to the importance of routines or warmth. Um, not that they're not important things, but they don't seem to explain disruptions to children's mental health. That's it. Sorry. No, great. That was great. Um, thank you so much. And I think what we're going to do now is um, turn it over to Mark Feinberg, and uh, we'll have sort of a, a continuation of the family um, theme on this in, in Mark's research. And Mark, I'll do the same thing if it's all right. I'll just sort of pop in 
and give you a one minute warning uh, when we get close, okay? Is Mark with us? Here, oh. can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sure. great. And Meg, if you could actually give me a five minute warning, that would be great. Oh, sure, yeah. I'll just pop in and give you a five minute warning. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, following on Greg's talk, this is a kind of parallel a study we've been doing during COVID with a different randomized trial uh, uh, sample that we've been following for about 10 years, um, who originally were randomized to receive the Family Foundations program or not. Um, and I just want to mention that uh, Sam Tornello in HDFS has also in parallel um, been surveying, surveying a sample of um, sexual minority parents. Um, so we have three parallel studies where we can understand what's going on for families during COVID. And I'm going to focus on intervention impacts um, in, on families in this trial during COVID. Um, and uh, I think uh, Greg was starting to refer to uh, financial strain as a, as a factor. Um, I, I'm going to, some of the work here is based on Rand Conger's family stress model. Um, he did research with families during the Iowa family farm crisis. And then there's also research by uh, Elder and others on the Great Depression in it. Um, uh, Conger's work indicates that there's a cascade from economic strain to parent mental health uh, issues and stress. Um, and uh, in some research that is mediated by interparental conflict um, in its path towards uh, disrupted parenting and ultimately um, uh, disruptions and problems for children's mental and behavioral health. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a quick little background on Family Foundations and its focus on co-parenting um, as an intervention uh, target and the reason for that. Um, and I start with some interrelated problems around parents and, per and parenting, um, which I won't describe. Um, and you can see on the on the um, figure, but in thinking about how to support parents, um, I'm, I'm looking for a common factor that's going to help all of these different domains. And uh, one that's emerged strongly in the literature is interparental conflict. And uh, about 20 years ago, um, I started thinking about co-parenting and the ways parents coordinate and support each other in their parenting relationship um, as a refined target um, that it, uh, in some research, co-parenting has a stronger influence on parent well-being and mental health and parenting quality than the general um, uh, couple relationship uh, construct. And research has shown that uh, co-parenting is related to children's outcomes from infant infancy through adolescence across many different domains. And uh, one reason I believe is because the co-parenting relationship, especially um, during infancy and early childhood, but throughout child rearing is the foundation of how a parent feels about themselves as a parent. And because parenting is our um, very, very uh, fundamental identity um, uh, in, in, in all societies, most societies, um, it's very important for our general well-being as well. Um, and so the very simple conceptual model is that um, the Family Foundation programs targeting almost solely the co-parenting relationship around uh, during pregnancy and during infancy, um, then would strongly in, impact parents' well-being and adjustment, impacting parenting quality, and finally child well-being. Um, and uh, this could be seen as kind of a uh, long path to get to uh, improving children's well-being. 
Um, but the, uh, the trials we've done to date indicates that uh, this cascade is working. Um, the work I'm going to describe today with COVID um, is our second trial of family foundations, um, which started with 399 couples expecting a first child. Um, and they receive, and they were randomized, and the intervention group received the uh, family foundations uh, nine classes before and after birth. Um, and just to summarize uh, uh, outcomes until this point um, in that trial, we see at um, six months after birth through three years after birth, there have been positive impacts. Um, that we've reported on our targets, co-parenting, parent mental health, and then parenting quality, as well as um, at uh, during infancy on children's self-regulation, sleep, soothability, and attention. At age three years, again, by parent report on children's social competence, and also for boys internalizing and externalizing. And then at seven years by teacher report, um, teachers are reporting that the Family Foundation kids are doing better in terms of internalizing, that boys are doing better in terms of externalizing, and that um, in risk moderation analyses, we found that um, both boys and girls who were at, whose parents had moderately higher levels of uh, conflict during pregnancy, they're doing better in terms of externalizing and in terms of school adjustment. So uh, we've hit all of the targets in the conceptual model, and we even found some additional um, outcomes that we didn't hypothesize, but that makes sense. Um, and we could elaborate on that another time. So um, in looking at the impact of family foundations during the COVID pandemic, first, I just wanna note that um, in Australia, they've been delivering uh, the program uh, through home visiting to families at risk for family violence. And there's some nice qualitative feedback during that period, such as this quote um, from parents saying that this has helped them a great deal during the lockdown periods um, and helped them to live together in close proximity. Um, and uh, also, I want to think about the comparison of the changes that parents go through during a transition to parenthood and during the early COVID period, which um, uh, I think we were right now we're in a very different emotional state. But back in uh, March and April uh, and May, I think we were at a very higher level of anxiety and stress. Um, and for all of us and, and parents, there were new household supplies to think about. Um, for parents, there were increased um, caregiving uh, demands. Uh, children were having more emotional problems um, and needed more emotional support. There were new health concerns um, that parents needed to be concerned about, just as they were about new health concerns for infants during uh, when they had infants, uh, their first child. There were demands for increased coordination um, in managing work and caregiving, and um, there are increases in um, uh, mental health problems. So the, my thinking about a conceptual model for um, uh, how family foundations might influence um, families' adjustment is um, that, um, here we go, that the intervention had an impact on the uh, cluster of family constructs, not just co-parenting, but a parent adjustment, parenting quality and child adjustment. Um, and for those families, the stressors of the pandemic were, um, they, that parents were able to meet those stressors with enhanced co-parenting coordination um, and support for each other. And that reduced the effect of those stressors on parents' well, well-being and mental health. 
And similarly, in those families that had better parenting quality as a result of the intervention, that reduced the effect of the stressors on children's mental health problems. So that's the theory. And then um, as families are functioning better, especially if they're having, if, if parents are able to make decisions and coordinate more effectively, we might see better social distancing and um, health protective uh, behaviors that families are able to sustain over a longer period of time. And Mark, we're at the five minute mark. Okay. So um, uh, during this pandemic wave um, in April and May, we administered a web-based questionnaire similar to the one in PROSPER. We also asked parents to complete eight days of a brief daily report. And here we're averaging across um, those daily re reports um, and parents completed an average of almost seven days. And uh, we did see just looking at change from before COVID to COVID, where we saw very large decrements, deterioration in parents' mental health and depression, um, huge changes in co-parenting quality and in children's internalizing and externalizing behaviors. When we looked at, um, uh, the, when we compared the intervention to the control families based on the parents report during COVID, we saw parents in the intervention condition were, were less hostile in general. Um, we did not find an effect, on, an effect on depression, nor did we find an effect on children's internalizing and externalizing with our uh, standard questionnaire measure. But we did find effects on children's negative mood and behavior problems with our daily reports, which may be more sensitive. Um, at, to change at that point. We also found um, robust effects, I think, on different dimensions of family relationships, on the couple, on uh, parenting quality, both positive and negative, on sibling relationships, and on general family cohesion. And finally, um, a, a second way of looking at preventive effects is not just did we change levels, but did we protect families from risk factors? So in families that had, um, in the control families, in the solid line, we see a relationship between depressive symptoms before COVID and parent aggression during COVID. Um, but in the intervention group, we, we uh, see basically a flat line indicating that we, um, we reduced that uh, that connection and we protected, we were protected families in terms of parents' depression um, as a risk factor. We protected them during COVID um, from increasing levels of parent aggression and similarly with decreasing levels of family cohesion that we saw in the, in the um, control families. Um, do I have one minute? You have two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, and then just finally, um, uh, these are, this is preliminary um, uh, analysis that uh, Sunny Bai in HDFS has been leading. Looking here, we're looking at the, um, at the daily level, at the connection of, in this case, social distancing behaviors, which parents reported, and um, their own and their child's well-being and uh, relational quality. And we're finding that families that do more social distancing in general have more disagreement within the family about social distancing, have more overall stress. Um, parents demonstrate a more negative mood. There's more tension in the co-parenting relationship and um, there are more uh, negative discipline strategies being used. So we're finding interesting relationships that we need to explore further between implementing social distancing and distress in the family and at the within family level. So this is the day-to-day -day level. We find that 
when families, when parents are doing more social distancing, they're also reporting more health-related worries and negative mood, and they're using more negative discipline strategies with their children. Um, so in terms of public health and helping families sustain social distancing, um, these are some of the things that we want to explore so that we can support families to protect their health um, as well as their mental health and their relationships. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, so again, just such an impressive <laughs> response under this, this circumstance. Again, really showcasing our translational spectrum from basic research to intervention research. We're now going to turn to Taylor Scott, who um, is the co-director of the Research to Policy Collaboration um, to sort of help us understand some communication research that she's doing around policy. So Taylor, do you want to go ahead and get started? Sure. Thank you, Meg. And thank you like, others. Would you like a five minute warning and a two minute I would warning? love that. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate um, everyone being here today. I'm not sure how I can follow such great work that um, Greg and Mark are doing. Uh, really exciting things. Um, is that showing my screen properly? I'm not showing the like preview. I'm showing the actual one, right? Okay. All right. So um, I'll try to do it justice. Uh, we also have received support from um, Huck Institute that allowed us to seed a larger project to test science communication strategies around COVID-19. Um, we think about our work at the Research to Policy Collaboration as sort of meta science in that we're thinking about the science of science and how policymakers use research evidence. Um, this work was later also supported by William C. Grant Foundation and National Science Foundation. We're really excited. Um, I'm going to give you guys some preliminary data today. And um, we have conducted 50 randomized controlled trials so far on science um, communication strategies. And um, so I'll preview those results. What's to come is we'll also be hoping to investigate the potential impact of disseminating the, these, um, the sciences among policymakers at both state and federal levels. So our goal is um, really being this bridge and broker between research and policy communities. And the focus of today's talk is really emphasizing how we translate research findings. I wanna start with a conceptual framework. I stole this cake metaphor <clears throat> from Ann Bowes who presented on her book, um, Evidence and Policy. Um, she says that as a field, we really started by thinking about how research gets used in terms of how it's disseminated. We need to make our research more accessible and therefore people will come. Um, but at the next step, of, uh, we have learned that relationships are really important and um, interactions can be really critical for helping to make sense out of how to use research and its implications. Um, and that's because uh, policy moves fast and we need to be responsive and be providing uh, relevant research at the right time. And collaboration may really have an um, opportunity for us to support these interactions, but also understand how we can be timely and relevant in sciences. And the top layer is the icing of the cake, right? And it kind of holds everything together. And that's where we really want to go is how we think about how um, our institutions can be supporting the transfer of knowledge from its generation into actual, actual um, use by, by decision makers of all types. And that's not just policymakers, but practitioners as well. Um, so a little bit more about who we are. The Research to Policy Collaboration facilitates partnerships between research and congressional offices. We have um, been working to adapt this at the state level as well, so legislative offices in general. Uh, we start by understanding what policymakers' needs are, and then we identify researchers who have related experiences, and we broker their engagement. We view the bridge as really bi-directional in that um, not only are we hoping that policymakers might use research evidence that we've generated, but policymakers can also inform us too in how we communicate science and be timely and relevant or the kind of questions that policymakers have. 
So we anticipate by facilitating interactions, we can have a bi-directional information flow. Um, so if our core work really started around this interaction component, facilitating researcher policymaker communications, um, as you might imagine, COVID uh, sort of forced everyone to reconcile their you know, day to day activities and how that worked in a digital space. And so the Huck Institute's allowed us to think about how we do a virtual adaptation and we started to engage researchers in creating fact sheets that were based on priorities that we had already previously identified in these interactions. And that allowed us to then disseminate the fact sheets that we felt like were going to be relevant to policymakers' interests. And so what we um, have found also is that dissemination might also support or increase our likelihood of engaging with offices. This has all been virtual, of course. We've held meetings. In fact, um, we've re received as a result of this dissemination process 74 requests from legislative offices in state and federal offices. Um, that includes consultations that have occurred 38 times and um, a number of meetings where we could um, continue to build capacity at the state level um, to further our potential impact. The theoretical feedback loop, of course, and, um, is that it's sort of this bi-directional thing. So um, we have also experienced that um, descriptively, there's been some, some success in reaching legislators. Oh, over 100,000 opened emails. Um, and that's across trials. I said 50 trials earlier. And um, our sample includes uh, these state legislators as well as state and federal legislative staff. 3, 000, about 4,000 state legislators and 5,000 state and federal staff. So we realized that um, decision making would be really fast paced um, because of the crisis and we wanted to find ways to be supportive and provide timely evidence. Um, because there's not like an evidence based practice to addressing a novel virus, we needed to draw upon what was best available knowledge. I think some of um, the theoretical frameworks that um, Greg and Mark presented, helping them to think about their own research. It helps us also think about well, what might be going on in the way of um, the intersection between social issues and um, the current, current dilemmas caused by social isolation or um, shutdowns and things like that. So uh, we also recognize that inequities were compounded and wanted to find ways to address um, the information gap there on how the effects of the virus were being disproportionately felt. Um, and so we um, sought to improve science communication and um, using the fact sheets, we targeted legislative audience. Fact sheets are about one to two pages. They're very concise um, with only one real key point and lots of embedded resources and links to find more information. Um, this was intended to increase the reach of research. Of course, there's other parts of the theoretical model as to whether or not people understand it and use it, which we um, can explore in uh, future studies. The, so we deployed uh, rapid cycle AB messaging trials, which really means that every time we tested something, it informed what we wanted to test again. Because language is complex, it's really hard to make a decision as, or it's hard to determine, is this message being opened more because of A or B? Or what if we reframe it and test that same theory again in different ways? And so replication has been very important for us to deepen our understanding. We're drawing theories from social psychology, such as persuasion tactics, um, use of research evidence theory, including how do we improve our perceived relevance. And um, the, these types of tactics have been um, also explored with primarily with advertising marketing um, research, but how can we use that for social good in the science of science? Um, we've used negative binomial regressions to assess how often the email was opened. And so my next slides, I'm going to um, provide you with some overviews of the earliest findings that are sort of in a snapshot just to sort of thematically group some of what we're starting to see. Um, 
the asterisks will indicate uh, significantly better open rates unless a click rate is noted. Uh, most of our trials to date have manipulated the subject line with the intent of affecting open rates. So therefore, we don't actually expect to see a lot of difference on the click rate yet in the study, in this stage of our study. Just to note the difference here, open rate is really about did they open the email based on the subject line, whereas click rate is once they're in the email, did they open the fact sheet itself? So first we wanted to think about all right, well, what if we personalize subject lines? And personalization for policymakers can look and feel a different ways. We can say their name, we can say their state, we can say their district. And so we have um, these three trials that we're providing results here. In trial one, we really were thinking more globalization. Is a global perspective versus an American perspective versus a state perspective going to be most op opened? Um, and what we found was that uh, the state was more successful and the same was true in a second trial where we replicated. And in fact, we also found that the name was uh, successfully more likely to be opened as well. Um, now, you'll also note that the, um, the name of the legislator and the name of the state are earlier in placement in these subject lines, whereas in, third, in the third trial, we did not have a significant finding, but what was noteworthy about this contextually is that we had a very high open rate for police community relations. Overall, it was much larger open rate than what we usually see. And so our ability to detect change means we muted. So Taylor, we're at five minutes. Okay. So let me fly through this a little bit just to kind of give you more snapshots. So classic persuasion theories from social science We've um, overwhelmingly found that persuasion tactics have not worked with this population. And what we're thinking is that um, it may trigger some perception of insider um, versus outsider bias, where if it's an advocacy organization that may be um, trying to manipulate policymakers, they may be more likely to click and open things that are more neutral. Uh, this allowed us to shift from a, um, a newsletter format to a grassroots format. This whole theory um, also informed us testing, okay, well, what if we don't move away from this really advanced newsletter format and found that they were opening the plain email rate um, 24 times more. And when we moved to a completely grassroots format, which you can see is just like, you know, I'm a researcher, I sent you this thing, had 26 times um, more clicks than the newsletter. So it definitely informed how we approach this going forward. We've also tested messages on inequality where we found that, um, that problem frames and things that potentially elicit more emotion may be uh, performing better and being open more often. Um, and that includes things like uh, we have found that social disparities was performing um, it was, was opened more often than more neutral, uh, more neutral frames. Uh, we had some mixed findings here as well in the in a second trial. We didn't actually see inequities, but again, you see how this is placed. The manipulation is placed at the end of the subject line, and so we need to better understand if uh, we're diluting our effect by uh, the placement of the manipulation. Um, whereas we saw the words oppression um, perform better than some of these other frames, and perhaps that's even just more widely recognized and understood and emotionally triggering is oppression as opposed to a reframe like unequal threats. Uh, we tested again, we saw threats over solutions. And so that allowed us to actually, sorry, I feel like these are a little backwards. We had two subsequent theories after that. We were like, okay, well, maybe it's about emotions. And what we thought we found is that explicitly referencing emotions did not um, have an impact. Um, but we again see that there's more traction on this concerns frame. And um, we found that the um, evidence um, on police reporting was performing better than empathy. So maybe emotions are not actually as potent for this audience. It's important to remember that this is a policymaking audience, so it's not the same as other messaging work that's been done with general population or segments of the population. Um, overwhelmingly, we've found that problem frame messages are opened more often, but that comes 
sorry, I know I'm probably close to time, right? Now. Yeah, yeah. Um, overwhelmingly, we've found that problem frame over solution is open more often. And what we're contending with next is, is um, our potential to contribute to constructive messaging is really um, what we see in the literature. Theory suggests that, and other, other studies have found that problem frames might get more eyeballs, such as you know, even mainstream media and sensationalizing um, just to get viewers. But if by harping on the problems, we get more viewers, does that even still mean that we're being constructive in advancing social change? And so we have a lot more to test and unpack here how we can make it a productive message. Um, so we found that, you know, there's some support for relevance and tailoring to the audience. Also, not just tailoring that message, but what are the norms and language and motivations of your audience? In this case, policymakers may be different than the general population. Uh, what we seek to do is build routine evaluations so that this is embedded in our process of dissemination so that we can continue to learn. Um, and that means having uh, capacity to, to, um, to test science communication, which may have implications for organizations that want to engage in dissemination. How do we build capacity as a field to do more of this kind of work? Um, what we want to do in the future is understand its impact on bill language and how legislators comment. So we'll be doing um, coding of uh, use of research evidence in legislative activity. And I think that's it. So thank you guys. Great, thank you so much, Taylor. Um, I wanna, yeah, <laughs> so can clap on mute um, for all three of our, our presenters. The, again, the, the breadth and the depth of our research and the way that we're covering that translational spectrum is, is really important. I wanna open it up. Um, we have about 10 minutes left uh, in the seminar for questions. And uh, we don't have the raise hand feature available because we're not in a webinar mode. So the way that we're gonna uh, take questions is if you could open the chat and chat to all and just drop your name in, I'll be monitoring that and just sort of calling on, on folks um, as, as we populate that chat box. Um, let's see here, and Vanessa is going to help me as well. So I'm gonna shoot all. Just put questions here. And then one thing that I observed um, is uh, the through line of relationships and relational quality in all three of the, the presentations. So I just thought that was really, really interesting. Um, I'm just again, uh, looking at the chat, make sure that I have this up if people are dropping their names in for questions. Meg, could I just say something while you're looking for a question? Yeah, I see that you have one here too, yep. Um, I just want to say, um, uh, I don't know about Taylor, but I know for Greg and I and our team, um, for me, Michelle Hostetler and, and Joey Cifelli, um, trying to pivot and mount new data collection in the middle of a new pandemic was incredibly stressful. And um, uh, it, it, we were personally, you know, going through the same thing everybody else was. And then we were um, working really hard on this front as well. And I wanna thank um, everybody who worked on all of this research with us um, for, for going through that. Great, thanks, Mark. And um, you, had a, you had a question, what are the rates and differences of opening for Taylor? Sorry, what are the differences in open rates on yeah, Mark, do you want to restate that question, the rates and differences? Yeah, Taylor, you, you told us which ones, you know, were opened more, clicked more. I was just getting wondering for a general sense of what the, the baseline rates were and how big the differences were. Good question. And it varied a bit by sample. So you guys may have noticed we had some of the police um, work woven into that because, you know, 2020 has been complex and multiple <laughs> phenomenon happening that have been relevant to national policy. So we um, strove to adapt to incorporate some of that. So for instance, anything that was related to more of a judicial lens, we had a smaller sample. Um, I will say that for our primary sample, the COVID research has gone out mostly to health related committee staff and legislators. And that has, um, our sample there is about 8,000 
And um, once we moved away from the newsletter, because I said 26 times, I mean, it was serious difference. Once we went into this grassroots format, we see the open rates of the actual link are oftentimes um, between 400 and sometimes 800 times. And um, the folks working with us like to say um, that would pack any conference room, right? And so um, I think on the lower end, we've had fact sheets opened a few hundred times. Um, but it's really exciting to just get people's work out there, even if it's just being clicked on for just a second to see the headline. Great, thank you. Um, Stephanie Lanza, I believe you have a question about um, the relevance of findings over time. Yeah, I mean, this is something I asked myself too. I wondered if for any of the presenters, um, how, how specific do you think your findings during the pandemic are to this pandemic? And do you think that, that, that they will maintain relevance that we can take with us as we move forward in, in prevention research? I mean, I realize we don't know the answer, but I wonder what you all think. Right, right. we need to sample across pandemics. <laughs> Um, Wrong answer. I was actually thinking about for for Mark and Greg, the potential parallel with natural disasters and just in general, the great strain that families find from crisis as a whole. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. so, oh, go ahead, Mark. No, no, go ahead. You know, I, I think there's a few literatures that we're drawing from on, on you know, to try to extrapolate what the long term implications are for COVID. The natural disaster literature is a pretty popular option. Um, that literature speaks to a lot of things and, and the, it, it seems as though disruptions to the family, the literature I'm focusing on, um, and exposure to trauma, so loss of a, of a loved one or like in like hurricane literature, they're showing like if it was your house or your neighbor's house, like things that make it more personal, it seems to the individual um, can be amplified by disruptions to the family. I think children see the family disruption as a signal that this is a very significant event. Mm -hmm. And that seems to predict longer term. And, and longer term is usually maybe up to 18 months later. Um, but those studies are also benefit from a circumscribed event in the sense that, you know, hurricane hits, you know, and then there's the aftermath and, you know, this is really prolonged. So, you know, I think there's a lot of conversation about people remembering this experience in life. I think the question about, you know, the findings I presented today are really about the short-term effects. How are kids faring during COVID? How, how those perpetuate beyond this, you know, when there is an end point to it and if we have the aftermath and we're moving forward. I, you know, I think it's how families will recover from this event and return to normal or the ways in which we may see alterations to these relationships that um, are impacted pretty tremendously, right? So, I don't think we really have a clear picture, but I think there are long-term implications to consider, especially with how prolonged this experience has been. Thanks. And I, I just wanna um, add in, in two different directions. One is, I think this has relevance, not just for society-wide um, large-scale disasters, but also for personal crises and health crises and job loss and other things that families are going through. Um, on their own. And um, secondly, that um, in an in, uh, intervention pathway, our colleagues in Australia who've been um, uh, providing, continuing to provide um, the, a home visit version of family foundations um, for families at risk of family violence, um, switching to Zoom. Um, as I said, they found um, really good reception and now they are submitting, and we may also submit to NIH proposals to um, adapt some of our family uh, approaches to uh, towards a short, brief, um, multi-session um, crisis intervention support for families um, uh, that we would deliver through telehealth. Mm -hmm. um, that's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. From a policy perspective, that's really interesting, Mark, because there's just so many people in rural areas that don't have the potential access that um, would be helpful. I, I think that um, we've been testing, um, you know, multiple types of um, content because we want to test some of the context dependencies and our communication work. Um, however, I think 
there's still the potential risk that, you know, of course, when you are communicating at a time when information volume is high, because we have had multiple crises in the United States in, um, this year, it's just an unbelievable amount of noise to cut through to be able to get your information into the hands of policymakers. But I would say that hopefully if our te testing has been potent, that we're working uh, an uphill battle this year to get our information into the hands of policymakers. And hopefully that means that there wouldn't be some generalizability. I do stand by the need for you know ongoing testing capacity and continuing to refine strategies over time because that's the only way we'll we'll know and continue to improve. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, it's one o'clock and I'm um, sensitive to people's times and other, other commitments uh, this afternoon, but we're going to keep the, the room open. We have a number of questions coming through. So for those of you who can stay, um, please feel free to continue with the um, sort of the question and answer discussion period. Um, and I'm going to ask Vanessa if there's a way that we can also either screenshot or capture the chat questions and share with the presenters as well so they can start to see the kinds of um, sort of uh, pieces of information that, that the rest of the participants were interested in, in hearing more about. And dare I say, Stephanie and, and Ashley, that we may do sort of an update maybe towards the end of the spring where we kind of come back and just see if there's been some updates on the research and again sort of addressing some of these questions that might not um, have a, a full amount of time to address today. Just to wrap up, uh, two more sessions scheduled in this series, one on February 2nd and one on February 23rd. So thanks to all of our presenters. Please, for those of you who can continue the conversation, this is just absolutely fascinating and important, impactful work that we're doing. So thank you.